Glad to be here with you. I appreciate Pastor Spencer's asking us to come. And we're going to talk about the greatest possession. We're going to talk from John 3.16. Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, the greatest possession is not a number of things. We know that the greatest possession certainly is not wealth. We're glad that we have money. We're glad that we're not in need. Many people are impoverished and in need, but that's not the greatest possession. The Lord said, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And so possessions are good, but that's not the greatest possession. And wealth, no matter how rich or how poor or how needy it may be, the greatest possession is not success. Nothing wrong with success. Everybody likes to succeed, do that which is right, and get as high as you can, and so on and so forth. But Luke 12, 16 to 20 tells us there was a man, a very well-to-do man. He had plenty of wealth and plenty of barns and plenty of goods. And, uh, he said, I'm going to make a bigger barn. I'm going to see, put all my things in it and then see what's going to happen to me. But God said to him in Luke 12, 16, Thou fool! This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose will all these things be? That's the question. Who will take care of all the different things that you have made? You can't take it with you. We all know that. Everybody says it. As some people have said, there are no pockets in a shroud. The shroud being a suit that a man or a woman makes and lay, uh, has as they're in the coffin. No pockets because we can't take anything with us. Wealth, nothing wrong with wealth, but that's not the greatest possession at all. And not success, success of man's making big money and big barns. And the third thing, the greatest possession is not family. We're glad to have families. We have four sons and a daughter in our family. A small family by the park of some, a large family looking up by others. But the Lord Jesus said in Matthew 10:37, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. We cannot just put the family before everything else in our lives. Many people do. They say, whatever my mother wants me to do, whatever my father wants me to do, we'll do. My mom was a Methodist all of her life. In her days, there was a Bible-believing, preaching Methodist church, I'm sure. But she just stuck with that church no matter what. And in Naples, Florida, she wanted me to come and to preach in her church. I said, well, Mom, I'll be glad to preach. If they let me to say, come out of the National Council of Churches, come out of the World Council of Churches, and be separated, oh, the pastor said, we couldn't do that. So I said, Mom, I'm sorry, I won't be able to preach in your church. I went there a couple of years later. She wanted me to pray in the church. <laughs> Same thing. Now, Mom was furious at her son for not speaking in her church. I'm glad that she wanted me to, but there's something about a Bible-believing Christian preacher that has no business going into a modernistic apostate church pretending that that's all right, unless he can say, come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Family is important. I love my mom, and uh, I think finally she got over it, but it took her a while. And then notice the greatest possession is not possessions themselves. Not possessions themselves. All the things that we have, we have cars, every one of us, I'm sure, drove in here with some sort of a vehicle. We have homes, we have clothes of all sorts of things, and uh, we have lots of possessions. But in Ecclesiastes 2, verse 9, the King Solomon had a lot of possessions, and he looked upon all of his works, all that his hands had wrought, all the labor that he had labored, and behold, all was vanity. Very few people agree with Solomon on that because when they see all that they've done, they say, well, that's great. I'm a big person, a big man, a big woman. But Solomon was honest here. All was vanity, vexation of spirit. There was no profit under the sun. Possessions are fine unless they possess you and me. If our possessions possess us, something's wrong with us. We've got to say thank you for providing for us. God wants to provide for our needs, not for our greeds, but for our needs. Greatest of possessions, not possessions. Then the fifth thing about this, the greatest possession is not health. 
I'm not against being healthy. All of us would like to be healthy, and all of us who are here tonight, I'm sure, are able to walk in this building, and we can sing the songs of Zion, and we can do all these things. But health is not the main important thing. Paul found that out. He had a thorn in the flesh. God put it there for some reason. We don't know the reason. He wondered what it was and why it was there. He prayed three different times, Lord, remove that thorn in the flesh. And three different times God said, no, I want you to keep it, Paul, whether it was his, his lips and his tongue, whatever it was, what he couldn't speak right, uh, speech impediment, we don't know what it was. But the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Health, Paul, you don't have all the things you should have, but my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. And he finally got the, the picture of the Lord Jesus, and he said to the Lord, Therefore, he said, I will rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of God, the power of Christ, may rest upon me. So if we have infirmities, we've got to take the position of the Apostle Paul in that and be thankful that the Lord can honor our infirmities and honor us and honor him greater because of our infirmities. The greatest blessing is not a church. Churches are great, wonderful to have churches, big buildings like this one here, our church, Bible Free Baptist Church. Good, solid churches are fine, but that's not the greatest possession. And then the greatest possession is, is everlasting life. John 3.16 just has 25 words in English, 26 words in the Greek. Let's say it again together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now notice these ten things in that little simple verse. Very simple verse. All of us know that. We see ten things. The source of our salvation, the sentiment, the scope, the sacrifice, the Savior, the summons, the simplicity, the shelter, the security, and the splendor. The source of our salvation is for God. The only source of the Bible salvation is God. The world has all kinds of other salvations. The Mohammedans have their salvation. The American Indians have their type of salvation. And all the modern apostates have their view of heaven and salvation. But God's salvation in the Bible, the source of that is God himself. God. Look at some of the attributes of God. He's omnipotent, all-powerful. Nothing that he cannot do. He cannot sin. But, I mean, nothing he cannot do. He's powerful. That's why he provided for man's salvation. Jeremiah 32, 17. Uh, Jeremiah saw, O oh, Lord, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm. He doesn't, God doesn't believe in evolution. The whole thing with the scientific world, that all they're preaching and teaching in schools and colleges and seminaries that believe in evolution, that's not God's way. God created all this universe, the earth, the heavens, the stars, the planets, every single thing, the trees and the shrubs and the plants and people. And God is powerful. There's nothing too hard for thee. Thy great power, thy stretched out arm has made all these things. He's not only omnipotent and all-powerful, he's omniscient, he's all-knowing. He knows our hearts. He knows who we are, what we are, and why we're here. And he's looking at us. He's interested in our salvation, and he looks at every one of us in this room. I can't see your heart. God does, because he's omniscient. He knows whether you're saved or lost, whether you're going to heaven or going to hell. And all the people in this world, he knows our hearts. As it says in Hebrews 4.13, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. But also, another thing about God, he's omnipresent, everywhere present. He's here in this building in the Bible Presbyterian Church in Collingswood, New Jersey. He's everywhere in the world. He's over in Asia and in Europe and China and in Russia, everywhere present. In Psalm 139.7, David asks the question, Where shall I go from thy spirit? Where shall I flee from thy presence? If I send up to heaven... Thou art there. That's north. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. That's south. If 
I take the wings of the morning, that's east. If I dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, in Jerusalem, that's west. Even there shall thy hand lead me, thy right hand shall hold me. The Lord is everywhere, omnipresent, and you can't get away with anything from the Lord. He's omniscient, omnipresent. Notice the second thing about the sentiment of our salvation. God is the source. The sentiment is those two words, so loved. That's the sentiment. It wasn't to punish people, to send them to hell, that he sent his son. But he loved. Love was the sentiment that sent the Savior from heaven to this wicked world to be crucified. Ephesians 2.4 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. That was the motivation. That was the sentiment that sent Christ to be our Savior for our salvation. Love. 1 John 4.10, Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation, the satisfaction for our sins. That's the sentiment of our salvation. Love. Notice the third thing, the scope of our salvation. Two words, the world. God so loved the world. That's the scope. It's sinners of all kinds, all nations, all languages, all peoples, wherever they may be. As Isaiah 53, 6 says, all we like sheep. All the people in the world have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him, on the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, who would come, the iniquity, the sin of us all. I believe that's all people. I know they're hyper-Calvinists that say just the elect and so on. The scriptures are clear. He loved all. He died for all. The scope is for all. In Mark 16, 15, God says, Lord Jesus, in his great commission, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's for all the world. He just didn't say go to a certain group of people, just an elect group, but the whole world. And John the Baptist said of the Lord Jesus Christ in John 1, 29, he looked at him as he came, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That's the scope of God's salvation. Not simply a small little group of people, the sin of the world, but they must trust Christ in order to receive that salvation. In 1 John 2, My little children, these things are right unto you that you sin not. In any man's sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He's the propitiation, the satisfaction for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The scope of God's salvation is the whole world. Very clear in Scripture. Notice the fourth thing about this John 3.16, the sacrifice of salvation. Three words that he gave. God so loved the world that he gave. That's the sacrifice. Lord Jesus voluntarily left heaven above to come to this wicked world willingly to shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins, genuinely to, to die on that cross. In Romans 8.32 it says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall not with him also freely give us all things. Galatians 1.4 says, Who gave himself for our sins. That's the sacrifice. That's the cross for our sins. That he may deliver us from the present evil world. Ephesians 1 and verse 7 speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, In whom we have redemption through his blood. Not the blood that he had through his veins, the blood that was shed at the cross of Calvary. We don't go along with John MacArthur's thing that blood doesn't mean blood, it means just a, a metonym, a figure of speech for death. Blood is blood, hyma, the Greek word blood. Death is thanatos, death. And he's wrong when he says blood is not blood. The Lord Jesus shed his blood at the Bible says we have redemption through his blood. He shed his blood at his death, but the blood is the one that has re gives redemption for those that trust the Lord Jesus. And the Savior of salvation is the Lord Jesus himself. For four words, his only begotten Son gave his only begotten Son. Notice the Savior's person, the virgin birth. Many churches all around the world don't believe in his virgin birth. They believe that's a fable. Matthew 1.23 says very clearly, Behold, a virgin shall be with child. A miracle birth shall bring forth a son that shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, with us, God. God with us. His deity. He was perfect God as well as perfect man. That's the Savior of our salvation. Hebrews 1.8 says, Under the Son, he saith. 
The Father says to the Son, Thy throne, O God, is forever. The scepter of our right. Thy throne, O God, is a deity of our Savior, not just a man. Philippians 2, 5 and 8. Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Equal with God. Perfect deity as well as perfect humanity. The Lord Jesus Christ was not simply a man and only a man, but the God man, perfect God and perfect man. The Theanthropos, as I said, Thaos and Anthropos, the God man, all of us. Notice the thing about his sinlessness. Has no sin at all of any kind, our Savior. Which of you convinced of me of sin? It says in John 8, 46. In 1 Peter 2, 22, who did no sin. And in 1 John 3, 5, in him is no sin. The only reason that he could save us and die for our sins is when he had no sin of his own to take the sins in his own body on the cross of Calvary. Did no sin. Notice the Savior's work. His work in creation, major work. He's one of the creators of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. John 1, 3 says, All things were made by him. Speaking of the Word, the Lord Jesus. Without him was not anything made that was made. Ephesians 3, verse 9. It's been hidden God who created all things by Jesus Christ, the Creator. Those three words, by Jesus Christ, are omitted by the Gnostic critical Greek text. The new versions don't have by Jesus Christ because the Gnostics didn't believe that Christ was the Creator. Took them out, wiped them out, along with 300 and some 50 other different doctrines that they've eliminated. In Colossians 1.16, By Him are all things created that are in heaven and earth, visible and invisible. He's the Creator. Then His work in miracles. In Acts 2.22, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, a miracle-working Savior. And then notice the third thing, his substitutionary atonement for sin. 1 Peter 2.24, who his own self bare, carried our sins in his own body on the tree, on the cross. In 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, Christ our Passover sacrificed for us in our place for our sins. And then his bodily resurrection, his bodily ascension, his bodily return. It's the Savior of our salvation. In his resurrection, Matthew 28, 6, he's not here. He's risen. They went to see the place where the Lord lay. See the place where the Lord lay. His bodily ascension. In Acts 1 and verse 9, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight, disappeared bodily into heaven. His bodily return. In Acts 1, verse 11, as he ascended, he, the angel said, This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have taken into, seen him take into heaven. His bodily ascension was there as well. The sixth thing about our salvation, the summons of salvation. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son the summons that whosoever, that's everyone, Whosoever believeth in him. The summons in Matthew 11:28, the Lord Jesus says, All come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Not simply a small group of the elect. All you. In Acts 16, 31, that Philippian jailer, when he heard the apostles singing psalms at midnight, What must I do to be saved? Paul didn't say, You've got to be the elect first. No, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt be saved in thy house if they believe also. Everyone has a whosoever. Everyone can come to Christ. Revelation 22:17. Whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Nobody is shut out. It must be from our hearts, our will, to come to Christ. The seventh thing about that, that verse, the simplicity of salvation. Whosoever is a summons, believeth in him. That's a trust that is genuine, genuine belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, the word to believe in him, that's the simplicity of it. In John 3 18, he that believeth in him is not condemned, not judged. He, but this belief has got to be from the, not the head, but the heart. It's got to be genuine belief. You can't just simply recite a creed. When I was in the Methodist church, my mom made me go either to the Sunday school or the morning service. I preferred the Sunday school because the man talked about the things of the Lord. But in the church service, whenever I went, they recited the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father, Almighty Jesus Christ. A reciting a creed does not save. 
I was lost until I was 16 years of age as a young man. But when I trusted Christ personally with my heart, not simply the head, creeds will not save. People have creeds all over the place. All the different churches, the modernistic apostate churches have creeds. But that's a different situation. It's a question of true believeth on him should not perish. In John 3.36, it says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Trust genuinely in the Lord Jesus right now. Everlasting life is not something in the future. It is in the future, but it's also right in the now. The present has right now everlasting life. In John 6, verse 47, the Lord Jesus said, He that believeth on me hath, as present tense, right now has everlasting life. Trusting generally in the Lord. That's a wonderful situation. That's the situation that is necessary to be saved. Simplicity. In Romans 1.16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the good news about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, also to the Greek, everyone that believeth. This is a simplicity of salvation, so simple that people many times fail to understand it. They say, I've got to add to my, of this and I've got to be saved by my works, by my good deeds, by giving money by going to church. No, the salvation is by genuine faith and faith alone. In Romans 4, verse 5, very clear. To him that worketh not, after we're saved, God expects us to do good works that he provides for us unto salvation. But him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Faith and belief of the simplicity of God's salvation. Ephesians 2 and verse 8, For by grace ye are saved through faith, but not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. When God gives something by a gift, that means we don't work for it. It's a present given to us. When you get a gift for Christmas or a gift for birthday or some other gift that you have, you haven't earned it. It's been given by someone else that has earned it. This is what salvation is. The simplicity of it by God's grace, you say, but it must be through faith. And that faith has got to be genuine from the heart, not simply the head. The heart is important. Then the eighth thing about John 3.16 is the shelter, the shelter of salvation. Should not perish. In John 3.14 and 3.15, should not perish is eliminated. John 3.16, it's there, but she... 315 is eliminated by the Gnostic critical Greek text because they don't believe in hell. This should not perish speaks of hell, the fires of hell. We believe in a literal fiery hell. A lot of people say it's just a figurative thing. No, it's not. It's true. It's real. The Lord Jesus spoke of fires in hell, everlasting fires in hell, more than any other person in the New Testament. And it's everlasting, just like everlasting life. Some people say, oh, we can get out of hell. Just go there a little bit, then we get it out. No. If everlasting hell is just for a single minute or two, or a month or a year, then everlasting life is also for a single minute or a month or a year. Everlasting means everlasting, unending. In Matthew 25, verse 41, Lord Jesus, to those who rejected him, stands before them and judges them. Then he shall say to them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. God did not prepare hell for people. He prepared it for the devil and for his angels. And depart, everlasting fire. Two things about that. It's everlasting. Second thing, it's fire. It's real fire. Fire is there. And Revel uh, Mr. Camping, you know, he's, he's dead now. I don't know whether he's saved or lost. He was, he, he was one of these people who believed in the sovereign election. He didn't know whether he was elect or not, but he hoped so. He hoped so. So I don't know whether he's in heaven or hell. I really don't know. He doesn't know. had no assurance. I listened to him all the time when he was on the radio. Uh, but he, 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 one of the things he said, first of all, uh, hell is not everlasting. That was one of his teachings. Later on, he said, there's no such thing as hell. That's what his latest teaching before he died, no hell. The Lord Jesus said, everlasting, that's number one. Number two, everlasting fire. 
fire is there. Billy Graham, years ago, I wrote a doctoral dissertation, a Ph.D. dissertation for Purdue University on the evangelistic speaking of Billy Graham. One of the things I found in my research is he says there's no fire in hell. Billy Graham is a, is a compromising man, as many of you know, and he didn't say anything about the fires in hell. It's just a bad place, but no fire. Many have taken that same position as Billy Graham. The Lord Jesus said, depart into everlasting fire for those that reject the Lord Jesus. In Revelation 20 and verse 10, the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. That's a literal fire, a literal brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's an everlastingness of hell for those that reject the Lord Jesus Christ, the simplicity of everlasting life. Revelation 20 and verse 15, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire, fiery lake of hell. And so the shelter of salvation should not perish. If we believe John 3.16, if we're trusting the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have a shelter from this hell. It says we should not perish. God promises those of us who are trusting the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we will not perish. God declares it. No perishing for those that are trusting the Savior. That's the shelter of salvation. A ninth thing about it, the security, the security of salvation. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. But the security of salvation, but have security right now not tomorrow not the next day we have it tomorrow the next day but we also have it if we're genuinely saved right now everlasting life if we should die today we still have that everlasting life in John 3 verse 15 whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have right present tense eternal life in John 3 36 for example he that believeth on the son present tense, believes right now, genuinely believes on the Son, the Lord Jesus, has everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but we have everlasting life. It's a very present possession. And then John 5, 24, the Lord Jesus again said, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, hath, present tense, right now, hath everlasting life. To reject the Lord Jesus, we have everlasting fire, everlasting death. And shall not come into condemnation, but it's passed, instantly passed. In God's books, instantly passed from death unto life. Immediately upon genuine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In John 10, 27, the Lord Jesus talked to his disciples. He said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give, that's present tense, I give right now, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. These people that teach you can lose your salvation by sin is not biblical. Methodists and Nazarenes and all different denominations teach this, you can lose your salvation. The Bible knows nothing. The Lord Jesus said, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life, they shall never perish. I give unto them eternal life, never perishing, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The eternal, the security of salvation. Then the final, the tenth thing is the splendor, the splendor of salvation. He that believeth on the Son, the Lord Jesus, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever, whosoever, believeth in him should not perish, but have the splendor of salvation, everlasting life. Everlasting life. In John 14, the Lord Jesus said to his believing apostles, let not your heart be troubled. Probably they were troubled. He's going to leave them soon. He said, Lord, let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, the Father? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. For not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Those of you who believe in me, trust in me, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, 
and you may be also. Now, there are at least 22 facts about the splendor of God's salvation for those who are in heaven. Those that have trusted, genuinely trusted the Lord Jesus as their Savior. 22 different facts. The first thing about it, there are many mansions. He said that in John 14. Plenty of room. No space problems. No sign saying there's no room in the inn. Many mansions. The second fact, it's personal. It's personal. I provided a place for you. You who believe. You who are genuinely saved. You who are genuine Christians. True Christians. Personal. The Lord Jesus is preparing a place for you. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the sons of God. And we sh when he shall appear, we should be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We'll have glorified bodies. Those of us who are genuinely saved, genuine Christians, glorified bodies. The third fact of heaven, from that verse, genuine Christians will be like him in their resurrected bodies. Now, they're not, there's two different Greek words on like. One is homos, which is exactly the same. We're not going to be exactly the same as the Lord Jesus Christ. The other is homoios, similar. We'll have glorified bodies similar to the Lord Jesus Christ, not exactly the same. Homos, like homogenized milk form. We don't have because he's deity. We're not deity, but we'll be like him, similar to him. That's a fact in our resurrected bodies. The fourth thing about our splendor in heaven, the tabernacle of God is with the true Christians, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. It says in Revelation 21.3, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. So notice the tabernacle of God is is with the true Christian. He will dwell with them. The fifth thing about they will be his people. That's what the verse is teaching. The sixth thing, God himself shall be with them. He'll never leave them in the splendor of heaven. Number seven, God will be their God. These are facts about the splendor of our salvation. Revelation 21.4 gives some other facts about our splendor and our salvation in heaven. It says, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Notice the things that are mentioned in that verse. Number eight, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Number nine, no more death. Number ten, no more sorrow. Number eleven, no more crying. Number twelve, no more pain. Number thirteen, the former things, all of them, passed away. Revelation 22, verse 3, gives some other things, the splendor of heaven. Revelation 22, 3 says, There shall be no more curse for the throne of God, and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. So we see number 14 thing, there shall be no more curse. Number 15, the throne of God shall be there. Number 16, the throne of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, shall be there. Number 16, Number 17, the true Christian shall serve him. You wonder what are you going to do if you're saved and born again in heaven? You'll serve the Lord. That's what you'll do for all eternity, be serving to him. Some other things found in Revelation 22 and verse 4 about the splendor of our salvation. It says, they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Two more facts about the splendor of heaven. Number 18, they shall see his face. We can't see the face of the Lord now, but we will see his face with our glorified bodies. Number 19, his name shall be in their foreheads. Then Revelation 22:5. some of the other facts about the splendor of heaven. It says, there should be no night there. They need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Three more facts about the splendor of heaven in this verse. Number 20, there'll be no night there. Number 21, they'll have no need of candle or light of the sun. The Lord God will give them light. The Lord Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The 22nd thing, they shall reign 
forever and ever. John 3.16 has been described in summary form, very easily understood, that all of us can understand. I've known this for many years. I think it's a very good summation for God, the greatest lover, so loved the greatest degree, the world, the greatest company of people, that he gave the greatest act, his only begotten son, the greatest gift, that whosoever, the greatest invitation, believeth the greatest simplicity on him, the greatest person, should not perish the greatest deliverance, but the greatest difference, have the greatest certainty, everlasting life, the greatest possession. Have you in this church tonight genuinely trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? If not, now is the time. We don't know our hearts. We come to churches a lot of times and everybody sits there and we listen to the service. But only God knows our hearts. Only God knows the heart of everyone in this room, whether we're genuinely trusted the Savior or not. But if you have not done it before, if you're not sure you've ever done it before, do it tonight and receive the greatest possession, which is everlasting life. Let's close with a word of prayer. We thank Thee, Heavenly Father, for Thy grace. We thank Thee for Thy Son, the Lord Jesus, who left heaven above to die on the cross for our sins, that those who genuinely trust Him might have everlasting life, heaven above, in great splendor with Thee for all eternity. We ask Thee for these who are here tonight, Thou knowest their hearts, whether they're saved or whether they're lost, whether they've trusted the Savior or whether they've not. We ask the Lord to deal with them individually. If they've trusted our Savior, the Lord Jesus, help them to live for Him, to please Him, to study about Him, and to serve Him day by day. If they have need of a Savior, may they trust Him tonight and be gloriously saved. We thank Thee for Thy grace. Thank Thee for this church. Thank Thee for Pastor Spencer, his faithfulness in preaching. Take care of him. Be with him as he's away. And may our Savior be glorified in the meetings in the church while he's absent. May the people that come and preach thy word be used of thee to glorify thy Son. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. We're here to get back over to him.